how we get them in, how we actually agree for refugees to come to the UK, but that makes it sound like once you get here it's a walk in the park, and I think we can all understand that that's really not the case. Um, Matthew Powell isn't here, um, so I'm going to bring in our, our two speakers today are Sophie Williams from Docs Not Cops and Matt Goldborough, who is an immigration lawyer working closely with London to Calais. Um, so, Sophie, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, um, so hi. Um, I'm really sorry, everyone. I'd hope that there might be a projector, but um, for the people in the front row, at least you get the benefit of the, <laughs> the slides. Um, yeah, so I'm Sophie. I'm speaking from Docs Not Cops. Um, and that's an activist group that's made up of health workers um, and medical students and, uh, and activists who um, are opposing the Immigration Act um, and prevent legislation in the NHS. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was a group that was um, initiated by ACT UP, the uh, HIV and gay rights activists uh, based in London. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about the effect of the Immigration Act um, uh, in the NHS, uh, what it means for migrants um, ac accessing services um, and, and for those defending migrants' ability to access services, and tell you some stories about what the Act has actually done. Um, and what it means for NHS staff, and about how the rhetoric around immigration um, affects the NHS, um, including its ability to provide comprehensive care for all, um, including migrants, but, but for everyone in general. So um, uh, this, you know, this uh, kind of campaign against the Immigration Act, it's a struggle where there can be no distinction between uh, refugees and economic migrants, because that, um, that distinction becomes a wedge with which to dismantle the NHS um, as an institution for us all. So it kind of, although it sounds very specific from the outset, actually it has very far wide um, reaching implications. So um, in this session, so we're talking about struggles on arrival. So we're hearing about the um, brick walls uh, as migrants arrive in the UK. And we can talk about brick walls in two senses, right? We can talk about the physical um, and the constructed. Um, and migrants arriving in the UK face both. So uh, there are obviously the physical walls that people um, encounter um, through the violence of borders, and there are the physical walls of detention centres. Um, and then there are the walls that exist between people and the ability to live a decent life in this country. Um, the walls that are erected kind of in queues to register at GP practices or walls to access A&E services. Um, and so these walls, the internal borders that we heard about this morning, um, are created by the existence of external borders, of borders of nations, um, of a perceived entitlement, you know, this distinction between refugee, migrant, between good <coughs> refugees, bad refugees. And then, there, um, and then there's the... Um, the uh, the arguments of austerity and of finite resources as well that are peddled by the anti-immigration right that conclude that migrants don't deserve housing or education or health care. Um, and so I'm going to go into my first picture. And so this is us as a, as a um, group of activists highlighting one of these borders. So we're outside the Royal London um, in Whitechapel and basically we're giving information to both staff and um, users of the hospital about what the Immigration Act now means for them when they walk through those doors and exactly how they'll be treated as patients as a consequence of their immigration status. So um, unlike the first two walls that I talked about, the walls of, um, uh, of arriving in this country and the walls of being in detention, those being policed by police, um, the walls that I'm talking about only work by enlisting wider sections of society um, to police these boundaries, these borders, and those include landlords, social workers, teachers, and in what I'm interested in, the health service. And so this project requires individuals to believe, really believe, that the person in front of them is not the same as them, and that the person in front of them is different in some categorical way. And this is really helped by introducing statutory legislation to make people comply to it, and also bullying management as well to make people work in line with what legislation is there. Um, and together, this is what's happening in the NHS. It's both a group of people that work as what I'm going to describe later as overseas officers that are there to really push through the Immigration Act to the NHS. And then there's the management that encourages everybody else as members of um, members of staff in the NHS to, to, um, to pursue it. So... What has the Immigration Act actually said? So um, it's the 2014 Immigration Act, um, and basically it came through in different phases. So I'm afraid this is far too small for everyone to read, but the, um, the first phase was basically uh, drawing up of some legislation. The second phase was to gather identification of people that would count as migrants using the NHS and who could be charged in the NHS. Phase three started in April of this year, where people um, were charged a surcharge on the Everything wow. okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, the third phase was where people were charged a surcharge on top of their visa costs, so uh, anything between 150 and 200 pounds. Although I've heard some anecdotal stories of that being as high as 800 pounds. So there's no rationale to it whatsoever, but that started in April this year. And there's yet another phase um, where people will be charged not just for inpatient care, but for any care that requires a doctor. And so that means, although it says GP care is exempt, that actually means seeing a GP doctor rather than a GP nurse would be charged, going to A&E would be charged, as well as um, being an inpatient. So, um, basically, um, I'm going to try and talk to you about what does the Immigration Act actually mean in the NHS um, through three different, um, kind of, at three different points. So one, before you enter an NHS hospital or a GP, when you're actually receiving care, and then lastly, once you've received care, what happens next? So basically, before um, people access care, the four things that you need to know about the Immigration Act, basically. Um, so the Act was introduced in 2014, um, and its third phase, as highlighted here, um, uh, started uh, charging certain people up front of any hospital treatment. So there are two healthcare surcharges um, on visas uh, for more than six months, and so it's either £150 if you're a student or £250 <coughs> if you're um, a non-student, uh, and that's for every year of your visa. Anyone who's not paid the surcharge um, and is not ordinarily resident um, in the UK can pay for um, can be asked to pay for in inpatient services, regardless of whether they pay national insurance or tax. So you can pay national insurance, tax, contribute, whatever, and that you also have to pay the surcharge. Um, and those who are non-EU nationals who don't have a visa, or those who are EU nationals who don't have a health insurance card um, or any health insurance, those individuals can be charged for all of their care at the rate of 150% of the NHS cost. So it's a, it's a profit-making mechanism as well. Um, and even for those who've actually paid the surcharge, there's a get-out-of-jail card that says, if it's expensive, we could still charge you. So basically, some types of scans, some types of chemotherapy, for instance, there's no, there's no guarantee that you wouldn't actually be sent a bill at the end of your care, even though you've paid your surcharge. So, um, one, so the third thing that we need to know, um, the Act redefined ordinarily resident to mean that only people with um, indefinite leave to remain are automatically exempt. So everybody else who hasn't lived in the country for more than five years um, or more than ten years, depending upon your circumstances, um, will be automatically put through this immigration process of checking whether they've paid the surcharge or not. Um, and the fourth thing is that um, the Act encouraged GPs and other primary health services um, only to register individuals with a permanent address. And so um, they required a bill or a bank statement um, in order to be eligible. And so although GP services remain free at the moment in this current phase of the Act, it's actually become very difficult for people who are migrants in the UK to access those services. So... That's when people are thinking about going to an, an NHS hospital. They've not even got there. They're just thinking about it. Right. So now they've got to a hospital. And so what things do we need to know about um, how the Act implements on accessing treatment? So um, the Act puts new pressures on medical staff to decide whether treatment is immediately necessary um, or whether it can be withheld. And the Act states that hospitals can give um, immediately necessary treatment but that the bill um, must cost uh, must be set at a cost of 150%. All non-urgent care must be withheld. Um, and so the Act states that this decision can only be made by a doctor, but the common practice at the moment in many hospitals is for overseas officers, somebody paid solely to monitor the immigration status of patients, to monitor the treatments doctors give to patients without NHS numbers. And these are the patients that are most likely to be flagged up as migrants in the system. And so the overseas officers then question the medical team as to, as to whether those treatments are urgent or not. Right, so that in itself sounds, we've got a group of people that are then policing how healthcare staff work in NHS hospitals. The second point, there's pressure on staff to identify who may not be el eligible. And so although the Home Office claims that the new measures are not discriminatory and Christ knows how they've come to that conclusion, they because they apparently attack everybody's identity, they're in fact encouraging staff to profile individuals that walk through A&E. Thank you. Um, uh, and um, while cl clinical administrative staff are not expected to ask for evidence, um, in fact the questionnaires that often you're given when you go to a GP or you go to A&E or that you're, you know, you've been sent to a hospital already state you to, to put down your immigration status. And so by the very fact that that's the job that you're being asked to do, you are already profiling people. 
Um, thirdly, there's now a legal obligation for NHS organisations to, um, to establish whether a patient should be charged or whether they should be exempt. Um, and although the Secretary of State can waive any charges for a patient um, for exceptional humanitarian reasons, it just means that the, the Department of Health can cherry-pick the cases that fit its own agenda. Um, and if they really cared, why didn't they just extend the exemptions to everyone? Um, so, fourthly, the key implementation, um, uh, the key to the implementation of the Immigration Act is both clinical and administrative staff engaging with the overseas officers. And the Act requires NHS staff to raise the alarm um, to these particular individuals. Now, um, the Act makes it a statutory requirement um, for the hospitals to, to, uh, to um, charge patients where they can. Um, and because this is now adopted on often the contracts that lots of doctors and health workers have with their hospitals, it makes staff very vulnerable if they try to um, uh, kind of boycott any of the um, any of the Immigration Act or prevent legislation. Um, and there are some groups of people um, and some illnesses that are stated in the Act, act as exempt from charging, um, so uh, including um, victims of torture, TB patients, other kind of infectious diseases. But um, that's often not adequately recognised by the ind individuals responsible for recouping the cost from the overseas officers and them not actually being the clinicians involved. Um, and to be classified as exempt from charges, evidence is provided to the hospital and to the overseas officers, the very same people whose job depends upon recouping those costs. So inevitably there is a positive reinforcement of trying to find people that you can charge and sending out those bills. So what happens when people get a bill at the end of their care? So patients who are not deemed exempt by the hospital will receive a bill and patients can be um, charged retrospectively. So even if they've been told in hospital that their care should be free, they can still have their case reviewed and still be sent a bill afterwards. Um, uh, let's try and move through this a bit quicker. Um, and so uh, there are some statements that say things in the Act like, um, if it's not cost effective to recover the costs, or where there is no further practical means of pursuing debt recovery, the NHS hosp hospitals should um, should try should give people some slack. Um, but given um, that the Secretary of State, uh, you know, can also waive these charges, that sounds like quite a few loopholes. But actually, in its implementation, it's very. I'll show you some of the figures later about what the discrepancies are between the charges and the bills that are sent out and how much money they recoup. So. Um, in order for, uh, to resist the implementation, um, everybody needs to make the overseas officers' jobs very difficult, and that will depend on many factors, the will of the staff, um, patients uh, involved, and the consequences of the actions. Um, and so at the end, I'm going to come through some uh, examples of how we can all get involved in actually um, uh, uh, kind of resisting some of these things. So I want to just use some stories now to, to actually tell you what this means in the NHS. So, first story from Anna, um, so her name's been changed for this. Um, Anna met an elderly woman um, being admitted through A&E at a London hospital. The woman came to A&E with her son, who was a UK national. She was so ill that she couldn't speak for herself. Her son said that he had returned, um, sorry, her son said that she had returned from Nigeria and that she wasn't registered at a GP. Somebody who was part of the A&E team wasn't sure whether she was entitled to any care at an, at an NHS hospital, and that person informed the overseas officer. The woman was really sick, and she did end up being admitted um, as an inpatient. And then, while she was being made comfortable and given some necessary treatments, the medical team waited for several days to give her the scans that she needed to get a diagnosis, because the overseas team deemed that they weren't urgent. So this means that her care was delayed, um, uh, and in the end, there was actually a quirky twist to the story, and it turned out that she was a British national. So someone had just been overzealous to implement the Immigration Act. She went home without a bill, but that is not the case for so many people. So in this story, I think there are several things that we can talk about. Um, so for the woman, she was initially questioned over her eligibility to access medical help at all. You know, if you're urgently ill, the Act even states that you should receive medical care. She was denied investigations that would have sped up her recovery. And staying in hospital longer is also a bit of a risk. You know, there are other ill people. You catch things if you stay in hospital for too long. And I think that's the basis of a discriminatory kind of uh, case here. For the staff members involved, they didn't know about the... Um, the requirement to treat anyone regardless of their immigration status uh, if their care is deemed urgent. Both the, 
the staff member involved and the overseas officers were too quick to enforce the Immigration Act without checking all of the information. And the overseas officer, not the medical team, were directing some aspects of the patient's care. So it's um, not that health workers have suddenly become racist, but that the pressure of management in the NHS has reached a breaking point um, and people crack. And I think this story per perfectly illustrates the effects of the Act, discriminatory and widely and accurately implemented. Um, and there's also a very real question over the cost of the overseas officers themselves and how much money can be recouped at all. So I want to, this is way too small for people to read, but basically these are the results of freedom of information requests that Docs Not Cops have made to all sorts of hospitals across the UK about um, how much have those hospitals billed for, how much money have they actually got, and how much money do they spend on the staff themselves in the act of recouping. And so there's some fascinating figures. So um, my own um, trust, Northwest Thames, uh, so it spent £258,000 on the team and it recou recouped 58000 and that's in one year. So they recouped a quarter of the annual cost that it takes to, to implement these teams. Um, they didn't actually tell us how much they initially billed for. Um, but if we look at BART, so they billed for £3.3 million worth of treatment and they only recouped 300000 So that's a tenth of the cost. So we've got some real questions. Like, it begs the question, is it worth harassing these people at all? Um, and it's actually, like, it's very, we're trying to work out what to do with these figures because we don't want to send them to a place where they say, you're not trying hard enough, you can get more back. Right. We're trying to make the argument that actually, is it worth it at all? So we're trying to think about something clever to do with that. And then secondly, I want to show you this picture. So this is a poster that was up in my ward, and basically it reads, NHS hospital treatment is not free for everyone. And it has a white guy with a stethoscope, a white patient, and two white women wearing blue uniforms. And then underneath it says, um, if you are visiting the UK or not here um, on a lawful or settled basis, you may have to pay for your care. So, um, the term, so basically this comes from people, um, from a fear of immigration, and also a fear of health tourism. And I don't know if anyone here has come across the term health tourism, but I hear about it a lot. So um, the term was coined to describe the deliberate travel of people to the UK to use NHS services. Um, it's been used to... Sorry, is it all right if I have a couple more minutes okay, at the end? Ahead. Thank you. <laughs> um, so it's being used um, deliberately to divert the attention of health workers and the general public away from the sy systematic underfunding of the NHS and to blame long waiting times or A&E um, queues on migrants, uh, you know, visiting the UK only to use the NHS. Um, and, you know, in fact, there is no good evidence to suggest that health tourism is much of a problem. So the government's own figures estimate it to be anywhere between £10 million and £70 million a year, stating it's impossible to estimate with confidence what the actual figure is. Um, and looking at their numbers, basically, they, they look at where most people come from uh, who visit the UK, they look at what their health care costs would be back in their, in, in their home country, and they multiply the two. So where in that has, is there any evidence basis to suggest that this is the problem? Um, and furthermore, um, when private financial initiatives, so these are the mortgages that hospitals are now paying back as a consequence of new Labour's policies, cost about £10 um, billion pounds a year, that, um, so we're talking about a difference of, um, of like a factor of 10, the idea that health tourism is the cause of the crisis in the NHS is just laughable. Um, but so back to the picture. Um, the first message is that only white patients are eligible. The second message is that the NHS is a white British institution. Watch out if you're not white and British. Um, and I don't know whether anyone in this room is a health worker, or um, but many people will have visited a hospital. And um, this picture really fails to represent the diversity of people that work in the health sector. Um, and this leads me on to my last few points. So I want to talk a bit about um, rhetoric around immigration and how it impacts on staff within the NHS. So in 2012, Theresa May announced that anyone earning under £35,000 after having been living in the country for five years would be deported at the end of the sixth year, and that would start from April next year. So this announcement was a token to the Tory right, who felt that Cameron wasn't representing their concerns about immigration seriously. But this will have devastating consequences for around 250,000 migrants in the UK next April, um, and then that includes healthcare staff um, from junior doctors to nurses to healthcare assistants. And so the Royal College of Nurth Nursing has said that um, this particular act will um, 
will cause chaos in the health service, um, with only senior nurses earning above thirty thousand. Um, so nursing uh, nurses and healthcare assistants. Um, uh, which haven't been included on the list of shortage applications could find themselves being deported overnight. So the Royal College of Nurses estimated that um, up to 3,400 nurses who cost the NHS 20 million to recruit, right, because they've not been training anyone back in the UK for such a long time, there's now, they're now looking to bring people here, um, that they'll be affected initially, but that by 2020, 30,000 nurses will be affected, and that they cost almost um, 180 million pounds to recruit. And so that's 12% of the NHS um, uh, nursing staff that could be forced out within four years. Um, and that means continuing, basically, to recruit nurses from overseas, but without securing them any career progression. So what happens is that they will recruit people into the UK and then deport them after five years. And that way they will continue to have a cheap labour pool that they can bully and they can undermine and that they can basically use to, to, um, to kind of undermine the, the effectiveness of the, of the NHS. And so undoubtedly the effect of this policy will be uneven as well. Nationally it will be uneven. Um, it will be hospitals in more diverse and urban areas that will be disproportionately affected. And again that means lack of nursing staff means unsafe conditions and those will be affecting migrant and, um, and kind of working class uh, uh, communities. So I'm sorry that's very quick um, but okay so I just want to summarise um, uh, by saying I hope I've been able to show you how the Immigration Act and the NHS simultaneously attacks migrants' health and ability to access health services. It attacks the staff who work in the NHS. Um, and it attacks the ability of the NHS to, to continue to del deliver a service. So to summarise, the things that we can do together, um, so we can put in freedom of information requests um, on whose identities are being checked um, in A&Es and, and what the overseas officers are doing, um, so like what we're doing with the money that they recoup. We can support patients through migrant solidarity groups. So there's a fantastic soul-fed group that's down in Brighton. And basically, when they hear of a patient who's about to be charged, they go in and see the overseas officer. And they go and talk to the patient and their family, and they give them some support and some good legal advice. They then go and see the overseas officer, and they back up the individual's claims um, for uh, um, kind of... Uh, to be exempt from the charges. Um, for NHS staff, it's about non communication with overseas officers and it's about um, uh, joining the alternative clinics that are being put on that allow people to avoid the immigration um, uh, kind of checking that goes on when they arrive at AME. So, Doctors of the World run a migrants clinic in Bethnal Green, which basically aims at opening up access, and, um, access to people. So, if you're interested, get involved in that. Um, demonstration outside uh, hospitals and offices, so that's what um, Dr. Not Cops uh, get involved in. Um, also, migrant solidarity groups contacting Unison and Unite branches because it's worth us making the links now so that come April, when we are defending people from being deported, that we've already got those networks of people that we can get involved in and, and meet up with quickly. And then keeping up to date. So there's a Docs Not Cops website um, and we try to keep up um, kind of that up to date with all of the latest immigration um, information and if you have any personal stories as well it's really helpful for us to be able to use those in how we go and talk to overseas officers and how we um, run educational services for different hospitals so um, this is just a picture of us on the um, uh, unite no what was it it was one of the demonstrations last year with our no room for racism in the nhs banner um, but basically thank you very much for your attention <laughs> My, my name is Matthew Goldberg, I'm an immigration solicitor. I've been an immigration solicitor now for over 12 years. And sometimes when I, when I come to think about immigration law and, and borders between countries, I'm the one who, who would actually vote for Christmas. I'm the turkey that would vote for Christmas. Because actually <laughs> I, want, I want the borders to open and I want the immigration laws to be, dis, to be disbanded. And that's, that's my starting position. Uh, I'm, I'm, an, I'm, internationalist, I'm an internationalist, and that's where my starting position actually is. Theresa May doesn't think much of immigration solicitors. You may have heard a part of her speech where in the, at the Tory conference when she said that she objected to immigration solicitors acting on behalf of lawyers, acting on behalf of their clients, i.e. migrants, refugees, whatever, and obstructing her ability to be able to remove them from the United Kingdom. That, that is what her, that's what she said in the, in the thing. Therefore, you know, I'm sorry, Theresa May, I'm going to be a pain in your bum until the borders has come down. The, speaking personally, as, as, as myself, 
I'm, 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 a, uh, I'm the offspring of a, of a refugee. My, my grandfather came from Russia in 1905. He had been he was expelled from Russia because he was Jewish. He had, had the village, he'd had the village burned down and he had people killed because they were Jewish. He left, he left Russia because of that. Now that's, that's a, re, a real refugee experience. Now, my other side of my family is another issue as well. They, 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 were, they, they, they left France some about 200 or so years ago because they were Protestant and they were leaving Catholic France because they were, they were persecuted because they were Protestant in, in France. Now, as it stands at the moment, I mean, as I say, I have been and gone to see, uh, gone to, gone to uh, Calais, gone to, gone, to, gone to witness myself the, the situation in Calais. And 4,000, 5,000 people, doesn't matter who, there's still four, 5,000 people. And they're, and they're stuck at the border behind a wire, razor wire fence, patrolled by um, immigration officers on behalf of Britain or uh, police on behalf of France. And there's a second situation. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this bottle of water here. There's no clean water. You know, this is a situation in, on, on Britain's borders. If you actually, some of the refugee camps which, you, which are in the Middle East, at least, at least they've got clean water. In Calais, they haven't got clean water. Um, now, part of all of this is Britain turns around and says to the world, Many years ago, in 1950, 1951, when they signed up to the Refugee Convention, when they, when they wrote the European Convention on Human Rights, when they signed up for membership of the European Union, and they signed up for qualification directive regarding treatment of asylum seekers, they did all this, and other international conventions, such as trafficking conventions and things like this, they did all this, it looks good on the television, doesn't it? You know, we, we, we care about human beings. We care about human rights of human beings. And then when it comes into practice, what they do is, is actually the complete opposite. They don't care that somebody is actually facing persecution in their own country. They don't care that they are, people in their, own, in their own country are facing um, human rights abuse at the hands of governments, or at, at the hands of so-called non-state agents, etc., etc., etc. The... They have, as I say, they have this obligation, and then they have this narrative, the narrative which says that, as has been said before, we have economic migrants, well, we're dealing with them through immigration controls, and you know, we want to put a cap on those numbers uh, for, their own, for their own idiotic reasons, but nevertheless. And then they, sort of, then they talk about, oh, well, there's, then there's refugees, but then there's genuine refugees, i.e. those who are stuck in camps somewhere in the Middle East, somewhere a long way away, as the, from refugees have actually managed even as far, to get as far as the United Kingdom, whereas of course a number of people haven't got as far as the United Kingdom, because what they've done in the past is created a situation that if you want, if you try to flee your country because there is a problem and you think that the United Kingdom will be a good place to come to, what, what's the first thing you're supposed to do is to go along to the British Embassy and get a visa to come to the UK. Now, that of course is then an instant barrier because of course you, why, why do you want to come to the UK? I want to visit it. All right, you come to the UK to visit it. If you're lucky, you arrive at the airport and you turn up and say, actually I want to claim asylum, sorry. They turn around and say, well, sorry, you've arrived at the airport on a visitor visa and you are dece you've deceived us, haven't you? When you entered the country, you deceived us. Therefore, you are an illegal entrant. And it's the same from what my friend earlier on said, when she arrived in the country from Syria, she was a student here. And after being in the UK, a situation developed in Syria and she could no longer return to Syria and therefore makes an asylum claim. It is what is what is so-called a surplus asylum claim. But the first things first, the, Im the immigration officer in this country turned, then turned around and said, oh, were well, you, you feared going back when you arrived, and therefore you've deceived us now when you made your surplus asylum claim. So, again, the, 
and that is, again is a black mark straight against you um, for daring to make an asylum claim in the United Kingdom. The, the, you have the idea that if you make, a, because they, they are all full of this, that, oh, well, you should have made an asylum claim in the first available country. In other words, if you're in Syria, you go to Turkey, you make an asylum claim there. Problem, of course, is that sometimes a lot of countries in the Middle East don't accept, don't, aren't actually signatories of the Refugee Convention anyway. So, in, so they're actually not, say, not deemed safe countries. If people travel through Europe, Europe is supposedly deemed a safe country, safe, safe set of countries, rather. And yet, what is the reaction of numbers of uh, borders, you know, like Hungary, like Croatia, etc., etc., etc.? Well, what are they doing? They are saying, again, they are refusing people to go actually travel through Europe. But, and, and there's also questions, of course, is, in fact... Um, let us say, if you're a Hungarian Roma, for instance, is, is Hungary actually safe if you're Roma? The answer is no, it's not safe. But yet, Britain would say that you cannot make an asylum claim from, against Hungary because it's deemed safe, even if you're Roma and you've come to the UK. The, it is... These are... I mean, the, as I say, that's even assuming you get... As, even if, assuming you get that far, because the determination process in the, in the UK for, is so full of, we don't believe you. We, there is a credibility, there is a huge, they, the first things that the British government says, we don't believe you, you've got to prove it, that it, these things happen to you. Now, as, as pointed out by other people, how do you prove your guy? It's a... One of those phenomenal questions that um, comes across day and day. It's, it's actually the funny thing about, well, not so funny, the funny thing about if you try and make an asylum claim in the United Kingdom on the basis of your guy, it was one of those things that they've been systematically refusing people and saying, well, it's not, it's not, within, the, it's not within the Refugee Convention to be gay, and if you can only make an asylum claim if, you, if you're within the Refugee Convention. But, I mean, they eventually accepted that maybe this, this could be possible. But, as was suggested earlier on, people have been saying, well, what do I do to, to prove I'm gay? You know, I mean, and, and how much prejudice is involved in somebody determining whether somebody's gay or not? How much, you know, the, the invidious questioning that was involved uh, of, gay, of, of gay asylum seekers. I mean, I've, I've dealt with, I've dealt with many, many gay asylum seekers, and uh, you know, you, Pete, they they would put photographs together. This is me, and, this is this is me and my partner. This is us and our date, etc., 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 and all this. And they said, oh, you, you staged that. Even somebody said, "Well, maybe we should have maybe we should have a video of us having sex together if that's if that's what it takes." And I've even had immigration judges turn around and say, "If you, if you had done that, you're still you're still staging it. It doesn't prove anything." <laughs> and I mean, and mind you, I've also had an immigration judge tell me that um, as a uh, when he refused somebody's claim that they were um, actually married to each other, they said. You know, even if you even if even if you had sex on the table in front of me, you wouldn't. I wouldn't believe you're actually married. I mean, it's it's ludicrous. But we go. This is these are the things that people have to face when they come to the United Kingdom. The idea that uh, you know, the, how to, you've got to prove that you are you are a refugee, and you know that you have a so-called well-founded fear of persecution. One of the things that Cameron and and, and May won't talk about is that for citizens from Syria or citizens or even people who are in Syria are actually Iraqi citizens. You know, in other words, where Syria had become the country of habitual residence because they themselves had moved from Iraq to Syria. In fact, the even Iraqis in Syria, having been driven across the border, they, they would be regarded as refugees. 
in the, if they actually got as far as to the UK, if they actually got as far as to the UK, it is virtual, it is virtual policy, although they don't, they don't want to talk about it. Um, the, it is also virtual policy that if you are Eritrean, that and and you come to the and you actually manage to get as far as the United Kingdom, Britain will recognise that um, you cannot return to Eritrea because of the because of the political situation and the military situation in Eritrea, and it is also virtually true of Sudan as well, but. They would do everything they can to say, well, by the way, you're not Eritrean at all, you actually come from Ethiopia. By the way, you're not, you don't come from Sudan, you actually come from Kenya. Now, they, they would do absolutely anything in order to say, you know, we don't believe you. Because, of course, most, a large number of people who come as refugees either will, um, will, lose, will come because they are, have paid an agent to come here and therefore have got passports which are, which are meaningless. Um, but the, I mean, as I say, the, 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 the situation then is, is that the, they, will, they will, whatever happens, let us say, I mean, that on a particular sub subject area of, of, of passports, because of course, yeah, okay, that's cool. Um, if you try and come to the UK, as I said, you know, you need a visa. Sometimes people will, can get, will, will, will pay agents to get, a, to get a passport, to get a visa, especially, you know, if you... And, and then people manage to come to the UK. And, and, they, arri and they arrive and they don't know what they don't know. And then they, they get the passport taken off. Oh, you've, uh, you've entered on, any, on a passport that isn't yours. Therefore, we'll use, it, we'll use that against you. Or... And this is what's happened in a number of cases in, uh, for Zimbabwe, where Zimbabweans fleeing um, Robert Mugabe go to South Africa, manage to get a passport in South Africa, and then come to the UK and claim, claim, claim asylum. Oh, you arrived, you came with a South African passport, which is yours, therefore you are South African, not that you're Zimbabwean. And... I mean, I'm, I've got a, uh, I've got a trafficking victim at the moment. She's, at the present time, she's only 17. But she has, um, she arrived with a trafficker with a passport that said she's 28. And the Home Office have got the passport and they said, look, here you go, you've got, you've got entry as somebody's spouse. You're 28, this is your name. Um, we, we don't accept that you're the age that you are. We don't, therefore, we have no obligations to look after you. Go back to go back to Nigeria, you, and you are 28, and you are you're not a victim of trafficking. And anybody who would who come who would come across her, they would look at her. I mean, she's very small. She's only about so high. She's not. She's she's tiny. And yet, oh, by the way, you're 28. And um, <clears throat> you must have been mature because you could you can sell bottles of water on the, on the local market, and that, and and there that that was that was worth a lot. But the determination process, as I say, is in all of these conventions is you've got to prove your case. We 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 won't facilitate. We won't help you to pr to prove anything. And. Uh, even if you go through the, have gone through that process, even if. The Home Office um, refuse you, and then you end up going through an appeal process system. And eventually, if you're very lucky, and you may end up being recognised as a refugee if you're very lucky. And so that stage, of course, is the next thing, which is never, which is which is only recently come out about now. Well, you only you've only got 28 days in which to having only even if you haven't even got your papers yet. By the way, you're supposed to leave. The accommodation that you've got. Otherwise, if you don't leave, you'll be ex expelled and you're put on the street. You've got nothing. And you haven't even got your papers yet to say that you can go and sign on. I mean, it, 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 it's in other words, even if you even if you are accepted being as a refugee in this country, which is, is not that rare, which is fairly rare, then you'll still end up on the street. The this is how this is the so-called welcome for genuine refugees, by the way. 
so-called genuine refugees in their, 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 their version of history. And the, this Cameron's promise about all oh, 20,000 people in four years, I'm not, I, don't, I don't really want to talk about figures. We're talking about people here. And the reality, the reality for Cameron is he knows very well that he wants to cherry pick from people in Syria, uh, in the, from the Syrian camps. That's all he wants to be. He doesn't want to cherry pick from anywhere else. You know, but there's never been any, there's never been any, uh, any cherry picking from, uh, let us say, Palestinian refugee camps. It's all, but at the moment he's, he's saying, we want to cherry pick. Well, the reality is, back to what my friend said earlier on, I want to, she want, I want to go back to Syria. She wants to go back to Syria. She doesn't want to, nece want to necessarily be cherry picked from somewhere in Turkey to go to come to the UK. And so people in that situation would actually rather, rather stay in the camp somewhere in Turkey rather than being dragged to, to Britain. So Cameron knows that very well. So in fact, the likelihood, in, by that means, the, the, the so-called 20,000 genuine in five years, the reality is that they won't. Those 20, you won't act 20,000 come. You know, and, 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 and he will turn around, I mean, because it was once said, there, there, there is, in theory, there's a, is an ongoing policy which, is, and, 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 which, was, which was to do with about 5,000, of which only about 1,100 have actually come. 3,900 3, un, under that previous scheme hadn't actually come. So in other words, what he's doing is talking, he's not talking about people as people, he's talking about numbers, he's talking about numbers, he's talking about numbers of migration, nothing else. That's why he's saying all 20. I'm sorry, I'm not with uh, the, the uh, speaker earlier on about the idea that uh, Britain should take its fair share. I'm sorry, Britain should open the bloody border. I mean, that's, I mean, that, I mean there's, there's no, there is no sense of fairness in any of this. The, as I say, the, we, we are dealing with this in... And, you know, in a, from a very, very harsh, harsh position, because the, the, the way that the 2014 Act was, was mentioned earlier on is that is we've restricted people's rights of appeal. If you, and so much so that it's been found that um, if you have an asylum claim and, or a human rights claim and this... Home Office decide that they're going to certify that claim, which means that you can only appeal the decision from, from abroad. You can't appeal it in the, in the United Kingdom. In other words, you will have to be removed be before you can appeal the decision. Now, how does that work on a refugee claim? I've no idea, because it will mean that you'll have to go back to, let us say, go back to Syria, and, um, and then you can have your appeal heard in the UK, when you're not here. How does that work? It doesn't work at all. It, 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 it is not offering people international protection, which Britain says it has signed up to when it signed up to the Refugee Convention. The, the next issue, again, on that, I mean, as, as I'll, I'll talk very briefly about uh, other situations whereby, as I said, we, I want to open the borders up. The reality is Britain is putting into place a closed borders, even in, in country. My friend has pointed out about the NHS. There's, a, there's another one that people would be probably more come, more, more come across as well, which is um, employment. Mm -hmm. How many people who are uh, foreign nationals who are working in, in whatever job it is, and their <coughs> status will come to an end in about say six months' time, and they will be making their application again to start. Employers turn around to them and say, "Well, it's going to come to the end. Then your contract will end at that point." And absolute, this is absolutely discriminatory decision making in in saying that somebody can no longer work because their immigration status has come to an end, even knowing damn well that they will be making an application for it to be extended. Um, this has happened, I've, I've a number of issues on this, um, I've got a number of employment tribunal cases because of this, where foreign nationals who've got leave to remain in the country 
they've got a job, and paying their taxes, quite right, they will now have to make their further leave application, pay the NHS surcharge, even though they've been paying NI for the last three, four years, doesn't matter. And the employer has said, sorry, you, I, can't, I can't employ you anymore. Um, you, you know, when you come back again with your, with your passport sorted out, in the meantime, no, you're, you're out of work. And, oh, of course, because you're a foreign national, you can't claim benefits either. So, in other words, you impoverish, you impoverish migrant foreign nationals in the country uh, in, during the whole process of swapping over or, or when, when they ap ap apply for further leave. Now, just a, one further point on that, because we're going to talk about refugees in country. In the past, if you were recognised as a refugee, you were, you were given what is known as indefinite leave to remain. In other words, you were treated as if you were, as if you were a British citizen, is, is, is the way that they essentially put it. That was changed to several years ago now, such that you made an asylum claim, you became a refugee, a fine tick box, you are given five years, and at the end of the fifth year, you could apply for indefinite leave to remain, and your 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 case would be subject to unquote active review. Now, what that means meant for some people, of course, is that the choice about where they were going to be is now back 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 in question again. In other words, if the if the country situation has, has reversed, let us say, you, you, you left because you were part of the Civil War, you're part of the Civil War one. now some people will just simply turn around and say, well I'm going back home anyway. But others, no, they said, well I've made my life in Britain now, so, so I, surely I should be able to, able to stay here. And they say, no, actually, that, that just because you chose, to, it's, you know, it's, it's now safe for you to return. So in other words, on active review, you will get sent back. And and this is, the, this is the very thing that Theresa May was talking about. She wants to make even refuge, people who are recognised as refugees into an extremely precarious situation. That they would be, their cases would be actively reviewed one year, every year, every two years, in the, way, in the way it is actually done in Germany. In other words, that it's, you're all, you, you will never be permanently anywhere. You will always be. They will always be subject to active review, and considering the state of play of, let us say, I'll, I'll take one country in particular, um, say Somalia, they, the British government uh, have recognised recognize for a long period of time that, by the way, actually uh, for, for Somalia it was, a bit of, it was a bit of a problem, but you could still go back, you know, you'd be, you'd be safe in various bits and pieces. Eventually the European court said, that's rubbish, you can't, you can't do it, you can't do it, I mean, you know. And eventually, they, well, all right, maybe. And then, and now they've, they, uh, a couple of years, a few years ago, they sent William Hague down there, and you know, with several armoured cars and uh, various military around him, and he, he turned around and said, oh, it's, it's getting a bit safe here now. It's getting a bit safe here, you know, I'm, I, was, I was safe, I'm fine, you know. And then, and, and the Home Office have been saying, well, it is safe. That, that little bit there, that bit around Mogadishu Airport and up to up the whatever, up through the refugee camps, it's 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 safe in that bit. Forget about Al Shabaab, <laughs> you know, it's safe there. Therefore, people, anybody in Somali can go back there. Now, like rubbish because of it. they they discovered, of course, that uh, the refugee camps themselves were, you know, you ended up with where where, where Somali where Somali women were being raped by UN troops. I mean, it's 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 in other words, it's not it's. It is not a safe environment for, for, for people to go back to, to Somalia. But they would they were doing all they can to say that it is safe and therefore there's no need for Somalis to, be, to, to, to remain in the UK. Anyway, as I say, as in conclusion, it is, not, it is not so much a welcome to refugees in the, in the UK. It is very much... Uh, a reactive, and it is very much a case of thank you very much. You're a refugee here, but however, we want you. We want you to leave ASAP. Um, so, as I said, as I said at the very beginning, I'm sorry, no. I'm, my position is open borders, and let, let me retire. <laughs>